Um, the first poem, I'm going to read two poems. The first I'll read is really a praise poem. And as I began to understand Angela's work, uh, this, this poem emerged. And I suppose what it's uh, essentially saying, it's the poem down here, a decorative art, which is dedicated to Angela, is that the, the, the object doesn't really require anything but its own language. It is its own language. <clears throat> a decorative art for Angela O'Kelly. For the contours you fashion in your decorative art, you turn to the hills of Sagard, where the heat of the night is the heat of the stars. But further back, as a child, did you look at the Chinese lantern, paper rose, at portraits from the Elizabethan age, the Tudor ruff worn by Shakespeare in his bard of Avon pose, the paper that you twist and coax into many shapes speaks its own language, so has no need of Latin words, Greek or Sanskrit, nor Gaelic either, or Egyptian hieroglyphs, no sweet phrase from holy psalms. The paper that you coil and stretch, flex and clench into necklace, bangle, bracelet, has hidden knots, rhythms for the eye, like the wings of moth and a butterfly. Um, <clears throat> when, I, when I was speaking uh, earlier across, across the way, I refer to the, the, the first conversations we had in that ongoing dialogue, um, and, and maps, old maps, we, we discovered a sort of a, a mutual affinity, in, an interest in old maps, and I have a particular interest in old maps of my own city of Dublin, and how <coughs> the, the city, the configuration of the city changed from those banks, those river banks down by the Liffey, and um, that, that prompting, that spark, from those conversations um, led to this second poem, Maps. By stealth, a city happens on the maps and in the annals. First, settlers gather where a town's born out of chance and stays close to its river banks, until at last the traces of its genesis are gone. Clay and wattle are exchanged for wood, wood replaced by stone, the building blocks of castle tower, the chapel on ground once dedicated to pagan gods. Open spaces are colonized by those who build, destroy, and build again their settlements and sanctuaries between the cesspits and where the court of conscience sits. Their gates and fences cannot repel conquerors, neighbours, the carrier of plagues, or the music that makes young maids learn their first dance steps. There are laws and punishments, new decrees for the common good. The cartographer comes and sketches the many angles and rough edges, the graveyards and ghettos that are barely distinguishable. He walks to the hill crest to view the belfries that one by one are heaven sent. On his map, he draws the routes that wander further from their source, the heartland of the city where things get lost for a thousand years, coins and cones, the imprint of a house not found until the city lights up its alphabet of neon. Thanks very much. Well, after that introduction to the whole exhibition, I think the, the grief is that Mary has gone beyond. <laughs> <laughs> it was brilliantly spoken, full of sympathy for the work of language and, and the plastic arts, as they say. And uh, she also said, quite rightly, that there are two different languages. The language of form, if you like, and the language of language. I will read two things. One, uh, one called To a Dutch Potter in Ireland. Potter may be the wrong word, I know, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> but we got through with it anyway. <laughs> so there's a reference to the goddess Silica, 
I got educated in seeing, really, by coming to uh, Thomastown and the House of Art there, the painter Barry Cook early days and Sonia, and uh, seeing things uh, that just by being close to them steadied you and made you uh, contemplate. So, as in this collection of uh, beautiful forms behind me, there is, a, I think, a votive aspect to Sonia's work, and it steadies us. The, to listen to the poem, the following is probably useful. Uh, it, it's about imagining uh, what it would have been like if we had both been youngsters together. And she would have been interested in clay, as I was, but a special clay, which was called band clay in our country. It was a kind of grey, it was diatomite, technically speaking. But we called it band clay, and it was underneath the ground, as it were. There was a, there was a humus, and then there was the diatomite. So uh, there was that to be involved, and also Sonia's genius as a maker of uh, glazes, and her communication of that to me once upon a time. Uh, she said that glazes, since they involved silica uh, in, in plants and so on, was like bringing down the sun. And the time I wrote the poem, uh, the first Gulf War was on, and people had set fire to the uh, wells. So the malignancy of that was set against, I hope, the benignity of bringing down the sun. So here's hoping. I mean, I'm an old school teacher, so I have to teach everything and leave it alone. <laughs> oh, I think I have to put on my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> the, the little poem to begin with is... Uh, the, uh, I think I have them here. <laughs> <laughs> they always say he arranged that, you know. <laughs> Anyway, let's get a pr and little introduction about going into the room with these urns and feeling verified in the work of, an, work of art, as it were. To a Dutch potter in Ireland, for Sonia Landwehr. Then I entered a strong room of vocabulary, where words, sorry, big one, can you hear all right? Then I entered a strong room of vocabulary where words like urns that had, been, that had come through the fire stood in their bone-dry alcoves like next to a kiln and came away changed like the guard who'd seen the stone move in the diamond blaze of air or the gates of horn behind the gates of clay. Sorry. The soils I knew ran dirty. River sand was the one clean thing that stayed itself in that slabbery, clabbery, wintry, puddled ground. Until I found ban clay, like wet daylight or viscous satin under the felt and freeze of humus layers, the true diatomite, discovered in a little sticky hole, grey-blue, dull-shining, scentless, touchable, like the earth's old ointment box, sticky and cool. At that stage, you were swimming in the sea or running from it, luminous with plankton, a nymph of phosphor by the Zootnorder Z, a vestal of the goddess Silica, she who was under grass and glass and ash in the fiery heartlands of Ceramica. We might have known each other then in that cold gleam life underground and off the water, weird twins of puddle paddle pit a pat, and might have done the small forbidden things, worked at mud pies or gone too high on swings, played secrets in the edge or touching tongues, but did not in the terrible event. Night after night in the Netherlands, you watched the bombers kill 
then heaven sent, came backlit from the fire through war and wartime, and ever after every blessed time, through glazes of fired quartz and iron and lime, as if, as if glazes, as you say, bring down the sun. <laughs> readings often you can't shut them up. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing? Okay. Anyway, things changed and nothing like that happened in our childhood in the terrible event. Instead, night after night in the Netherlands you watched the bombers kill. Then heaven sent came backlit from the fire through war and wartime and ever after, every blessed time, through glazes of fired quartz and iron and lime. And if glazes, as you say, bring down the sun, your potter's wheel is bringing up the earth. Hosanna ex infernis, burning wells. Hosanna in clean sand and kaolin. And now that the rye crop waves beside the ruins, in ash pits, oxides, shards, and chlorophyll. Next one is a shorter and needs no introduction really. It's about uh, blacksmith. It's a translation of a poem by Owen Roa Sulawain. And uh, it's certainly about the, the joy of craft and the, uh, the singing of the well-made thing. Uh, in this case, a spade which was uh, Owen Rua of Sulawine's tool to earn a living, he was a small pain travelling spaceman. Uh, so he speaks to the blacksmith Seamus Shem McGarrett uh, sometime in the late 18th century. Seamus, make me a sidearm to take on the earth a suitable tool for digging and grubbing the ground, lightsome and pleasant to lean on or cut with or lift, tastily finished and trim and ripe for the hand. No trace of the hammer to show on the sheen of the blade. They think to have purchase and spring and be fit for the strain. The shaft of it socketed in dead true and dead straight, and I'll work with the gang till I drop and never complain. The plate and the edge of it, not to be wrinkly or crooked. I see it well shaped from the anvil and sharp from the file. The grain of the wood and the line of the shaft nicely fitted. And best thing of all, the ring of it, sweet as a bell. Thank you. <laughs>